You're listening to The Dental Guys, episode 102, an interview with Jeff Rouse on treating sleep disordered breathing in the dental practice. Today, we talk to Jeff Rouse about integrating the Seattle protocol and other techniques into the modern dental practice. Can we make a business out of this, or is it just for idealists? We also dive into the, into the debate between controlling an airway problem versus actually resolving it. There's a reason Jeff Rouse is a very important part of Spear Education's faculty today. We're going to learn more about that this week on The Dental Guys. Looking for a lab that understands the bridge between art and science? Check out the Dental Crafters Network. Dental Crafters, one relationship, infinite possibilities. Contact them at 1-800-472-8302 or at dentalcrafters.net. Do you want to learn to predictably place and restore dental implants using the most modern science and technology? We are talking 60 hours of CE in a comprehensive curriculum and live surgical implant placement on pre-selected patients. Head over to restorativedrivenimplants.com to learn more today. Welcome to this week's episode of The Dental Guys. I'm John, The Dental Guy. And I'm Wes, The Dental Guy. John, it seems like that it's been a little while since we've been behind the microphone. For some reason, you know, we get these gaps in recording, but we record so many episodes ahead, so we don't... So family stuff, you know, we really try to optimize our time around our family and our practices, but we don't ever, hardly ever do we miss... You know, and every other Tuesday, as you guys know, that we release an episode every other Tuesday. And it's interesting, John, we've really never talked about why we chose Tuesdays, Mm. but there's a reason. And the reason is this is Dental Guys Trivia right here, 101. Yeah. The reason why we chose Tuesdays, if I remember right, it's because that was the day that you always got new CDs, right? Yes. It was album release day. Yes. And I worked back in, um, back in college, I worked at a record store for a summer. So it wasn't my main, I worked a lot of It's like, like Camelot music things. or something? <laughs> Dude, I, I mean, music has always been a, a huge part of my life. And I, you know, I play music and stuff like that. And anyway, um, but I worked at this, I worked at this record store and Everybody would come in on Tuesday to get the hottest jams. That's right, man. The jams. newest album. And those they aren't come just in. shorts, are they, John? Those are, those are tunes. <laughs> that's right. That's <laughs> right. And that's been the thing for the fat. It's been the past few decades. It's not new, mm. but it's always been a thing that, um, and, and why that started, okay? Because I actually, back in the day, I was interested in this is because they had the maximum seven days of sales that were uh, basically like when they were measuring album sales, they would look at uh, your your sales and you'd get the full like seven day cycle. Plus, it gave them the ability to stock up on stuff over the weekend to be ready for the release. Hmm. And I just remember we'd get these huge boxes and you could not open them. You could not open them until right. we would usually do it Monday night. We really weren't supposed to. Because we wanted to like, we would get one and bring it home and be like, dude, we got the new yeah. whatever. But anyway, so yeah, that's we took that into our show. So now you know why that started. And it's been, like you say, Wes, we've been pretty faithful about that and, right. and, uh, and fitting that in even with our crazy family schedules. And speaking of crazy schedules, oh, wow. we've got some pretty crazy stuff coming up. We're going to be out of town a lot in the next couple of months doing some massive dude i feel like the next six months is going to be it's going to be a blur it is i mean between the rdi series uh because we're getting ready to do a surgical series you know in the coming weeks right live surgery days are coming up which i'm super pumped about and and then right after that we're coming back we got a couple weeks and then it's out to spear education for what I kind of think uh, mm. will be our, our sort of capstone, if you will, uh, workshop that we've, and we've taken a lot of workshops out there. We've pretty much gone through the, the whole continuum from start to finish in the workshops. And mm. now we're going to the complex case planning, sequencing, and phased 
treatment. And this is one they only offer a couple times a year. Yeah, guess who's teaching it? Oh. Man, Darren Deister. There's, yeah. Oh, Full man. arch Darren. Yep. <laughs> That's right. Greg Kinzer. Full arch Greg. <laughs> Full arch Greg. <laughs> Full. And then we've got the ultimate in ceramics with Bob yeah. Winter. I mean, good. It is a safe. nerd fest. <laughs> And all like these no guys other. have been on our show before, and and they love just coming on and talking nuts and bolts with us, because that's what we yeah. do. And yep. man, this course, it is, I think you're right, John, it's probably the capstone. Like, yeah. y- you know, I'm so excited about it, because there's so many things that this course will allow us to feel more comfortable with. Um, yep. Think about being able to do... Um, temporary or provisional restorations, interim restorations in your full arch cases, many different ways, right? Mm -hmm. Um, Doing combo cases with specialists, with us doing more surgical cases and how to sequence a surgery with a full arch rehab, how to do... Yep. How to take patients from where they are now to where you want them to be. Unreal. If they can't afford to do the case all at once. Yeah, long-term temporization. You go to these courses like, I don't know, worn dentition. So good. Mm. So good. But basically, it is great if you have a patient who's ready to go right now because they teach you everything you need to know to treat these cases successfully. But what if a patient says, I got to do this over five years or four years, right? two years? Well, what are you going to do in the in the interim phase, and how do you make provisionals work for them? And what if you're incorporating implants, jumping them over from mm, teeth to implants, so and then how do you coordinate that with your surgeon so they understand? And we are super, super lucky to be going there with a surgeon, a lab, uh, not only Brad, the dental lab guy, but also a couple of ceramists that understand um, what... <laughs> how to do their stuff. And so they're going to be, t- we're going to be talking about, we got one EMAC specialist. We got one basically zirconian EMAC specialist. And then we got Brad, the dental lab guy. And, and it's going to be, and we're all sharing a giant nerd house. <laughs> it is. It's like in Scottsdale. Wait a minute. Is it like big brother where you all like go to <laughs> somebody point. may get kicked off the island. Somebody could get kicked off the island. And you, and I think you know who it's going to be. And I'm not going to say his <laughs> oh, name. Oh, I know who it is. <laughs> I know who it is, right? Yeah. And he's yep, not on yep, this yep. podcast, but. No, no, never been All on right, a podcast stop. and never will be. <laughs> right. So, but, but, like, <laughs> no, but I think that, like, when we get together and we get to, like, at the, can you imagine the end of the day, oh, you come man. home from this course and you get to sit across from your lab technician so, and, and discuss what you learned. Oh my! Brad's goodness. wife is coming and she's going to cook for us, so we can. I st- didn't know that. Yes, she's coming and she's going oh. to cook for us. So, oh, it's going to be beautiful, dude. They have a it's great. Gonna be so it's, beautiful. it's awesome. Now listen, we we pay for these courses, right? Yeah. And listen, every time that Spear withdraws the money for these courses, I don't even. I don't even, like when I first started going out there, John, it was really hard to do it the first couple times to send them that amount of money. It's a big investment. It's a big investment. Let me tell you, though, if you're ready, this is this is the place to start some of you. If you're interested in comprehensive dentistry, and it sounds like a commercial, but man, they have really changed our practices. And we really- Yeah, I mean, we've, we have invested a lot of money in that place. You know, they're not like, like, even though they've, even though they've had, we've had some of their people on, It's because we believe in what they're doing, Mm -hmm. but I mean, I would do it a million times over and I would gladly pay that money. And if you're even concerned about the money, let me just tell you how many times over Mm -hmm. I have gotten that money back Mm -hmm. in the cases that I've been able to do, not only do, but do predictably. Yeah. So So that's, that's we're obviously big believers. We just get excited because, you know, here we've worked our way up and it's like, you finally get to the point where you feel like you can speak the language. Yeah. So now... You feel like you can speak the language. You're going to be in a class full of people who speak the language, and they're going to be talking about stuff that you can really only understand once you've built up mm. to this point. So, yeah, it's it's a great feeling to be able to – it's like you've taken four years of Spanish and you finally get to go to Spain, you know, and you're like, all right, now That's a good we can actually it, live here and we can talk like they talk and we can understand what they're doing, and we've had enough experience between us with treating it the way that we've been treating it for the last three, four years – that we feel like we know where we need to go. And then hey, coming man. up in December. How about some plastic surgery or John? Yeah. How about how about you t- who I mean, who? if you ask people who's the best yeah. 
teacher or one of the best, if not the best teacher for soft tissue grafting, uh, minimally invasive, especially alloderm and comparing alloderm to connected tissue, it is Pat Allen. Man. And we are so excited because we're going out to take Pat Allen's course, Minimally Invasive Soft Tissue Grafting for Teeth and Implants. Out in Texas, mm -hmm. going out to Tejas. Going out to Dallas. Going down to some Dallas. Hey, get my cowboy up, buddy. hat on. We're going down there yeah. and saddle up and rip some soft That's tissue right. off the palate. That's All right, right partner. <laughs> And lasso yeah. it down to some teeth and implants. Yeah, so we're going to be going down to, and, and neither one of us, Wes or I, we, we have been reading, and we're going to be getting to this in some upcoming episodes about how, why are we so interested in mm. this concept? And some of that's going to come from a book mm. we're going to be talking about coming up, which we've talked a bit about Linkovicious. And if you know who Linkovicious is, you know the book we're talking about. And it really got us thinking about how we can augment soft tissue in our practices, both from a root coverage standpoint, but really more from an implant standpoint and how that affects our uh, our success of implants and bone loss. That's right. So we're just we're gonna we're gonna learn how to do this from from what maybe is the best guy or one of the best guys in the world. He's trained over two thousand people worldwide, so and he's amazing. So um, yeah. I'm excited. So we're just gonna be it. super busy with stuff that it's I think gonna be really have a direct impact on our practice. You know, some people have asked me before, they're like, man, you guys spend a lot of money on CE. I'll go back to that just one more time. Like, how many procedures does it take to pay this, to pay for this stuff? Not a lot. And these yeah. are the types of things that once you have this incorporated into your practice, I feel like it kind of changes things, Wes. It and, does, and, and for me, it never fails that when you come back you not only enhance your practice and what you're doing, but you enhance your referral base. You know, you're not just you're not just taking these courses to solidify or or co completely control everything in your practice. You're becoming aware of protocols and systems that allow you to refer more cases and help your specialists do even a better job. So I, I think it's great. I'm excited about these coming months. You know, this this episode we talk a lot about things that can impact your practice when it comes to sleep related breathing disorders and how to treat those in your dental practice and i believe you know jeff roush is one of probably the pioneers and one of the people that are kind of like you know leading the way leading the charge right now i will say this john I heard recently today, even and, and, and that some people consider this fringe. Some people consider this like we talked about certain things in dentistry years ago, when it, as it relates to occlusion, that this is a fad. Hmm. But as we've developed an airway study club, I think we're on the precipice of learning how to treat some of these things. Yeah, and it and, least, I, and when I what I and what I appreciate about what Jeff's doing is that he's taken, um, he's taken this whole idea of facially generated treatment planning. In other words, how to systematically approach treatment planning, and he is, along with Greg Kinzer and some other folks, developed mm -hmm. ways to systematically evaluate and treat to determine what a patient's real needs are and how to properly treat them yeah. because you know really we're finding out in this whole airway and dental sleep thing there's kind of two camps one is you know teach people to make appliances mm -hmm. and get people on appliances now we're not saying that's bad that helps a lot of people that's definitely a huge huge help and there's a huge need for that but the other camp is now hold on a second before you just put an appliance in somebody's mouth, mm -hmm. let's first of all find out why they have a problem. Let's find out if they even have a problem. Let's find out what's going to work for them before you make them an appliance. That's right. And then let's actually talk about could we do something to avoid them having to have an appliance. In other words, as Jeff would say it, can you make them the appliance? And, can you turn their body into the appliance? And to cap it all off, can you make a business out of this stuff? Yeah. Right? And, and that's what we're going to get into. That's what we we're get, into, get into, into a little that. bit of that today. I think it's exciting. And so we appreciate Jeff coming on the show. He's uh, been on our show before. He's well-spoken. And, and we really appreciate Spear Education for allowing us to interview Jeff. Um, and so here is the interview right after a word from our sponsor, uh, Jeff Roush. Thank you. 
Hey guys, it's Justin Goodbread here with Financially Simple. So in our last commercial, we talked about the eight key areas of business. We talked about planning leadership, sales and marketing, people and operations, and finally finance and legal. If you can master these eight key areas of business, you can build a best in class practice. Intangible assets are embedded within each of these eight key areas. Now, intangible assets are ultimately comprised of four items. You have social capital, structural capital, human capital, and customer capital. Those four areas are what drive up the intangible value of your company. Now, social capital refers to how your company is viewed by your potential customer base. Your structural capital deals with your operational systems. Your human capital addresses the quality of your team. And your customer capital analyzes your patient mix. Maximize these four areas and you can increase the value of your practice. Now, remember, if you have any questions, about how to increase the value of your practice or how to potentially double your net worth every three to five years, reach out to us via financiallysimple.com and we'll be more than happy to help you. For more information about today's topic and other dental related topics, head over to financiallysimple.com forward slash dentist. Until next time, make it a great day. All right, well, we are here today uh, with uh, someone who really doesn't need much of an introduction, but we'll do it anyway, just in case you've been living under a rock in the airway and sleep, dental sleep medicine world. We're here with Dr. Jeff Rouse, who, uh, you know, I, I was reading your bio earlier, Dr. Rouse, uh, Jeff, and um, I saw that you said you recognized as a pioneer in the field of airway prosthodontics. That's a, that's a pretty cool thing to be able to say about somebody, and, and I definitely would agree with that. Um, You've been involved with this in this world uh, for for longer than most, um, longer than, than almost all of us that have been involved in, in airway and, and and kind of where you. And interesting, uh, went to San Antonio, did GPR at UConn, which I went to dental school, and then you were in the the general dental world or or the family dental world for a long time. Went back into grad pros, and then got interested in, uh, in in airway and sleep medicine. I know you've kind of told your story before. Uh, on our show, as well as uh, at the through Spear, and of course, faculty there at uh, Spear Education. So, welcome back to the show. We're we're super glad to have you back. Yeah, thank you. Appreciate it. Somebody else obviously wrote the intro. If it said pioneer in anything, <laughs> <laughs> I figured. They're, you'd say that. They're, yeah, they. Uh, I I, you know, actually this weekend, uh, a guy came up to me, one of the speakers at the Spear Summit, and he said, "Oh, you're the airway guy." And, and it still strikes me as weird that I, cause I'm just kind of the dentist, uh, you know, I want to be known as a, as a good prosthodontist or a good, you know, when I was general dentist, I wanted to be known as the best that, you know, we had in San Antonio at least. And so worked hard at that. And so to be the airway guy it still is kind of a weird sounding thing to me. Yeah, some of the some of the people that you're working with too at the American Dental Association, and to bring awareness to screening for airway and some of the things that we're trying to standardize. Speak to that just a little bit. I know you were a part of some pretty big things in 2018 and coming into 2019. Yeah, uh, Steve Carsonson actually, who runs the sleep course out at Spear, uh, did a great job of setting up a uh, uh, sort of an outreach in pediatric airway. Um, you know, it was funny because the ADA in 2017 came out with statements saying that dentists really ought to be involved in screening the airway for their adult patients and using screening tools on their adult patients. And they really came up with a very strong statement on pediatrics saying that we have a huge role to play and dentistry uh, really ought to be involved in being a team member and making children's airways better. As with many um, sort of big organizations or government type of organizations, they tend to make rules without telling us how to, how to actually follow through with them. So we really don't have a great sense of how to go about screening. What, we don't even know what the, what the top five things to look for are in kids, and that's never been listed. So Steve put together a group, and there are now different subgroups so that are working on uh, figuring out what dentists should be doing in pediatric evaluations. What, do you, what 
and, and my big push in the group is to say, come up with five things that I can look at because you don't want to mess up everyone's practice. You don't want to give them an onerous task that they have to do. I think five quick things that are already things that they're going to be looking at anyway seem to make sense, but we'll see how it comes out and they're still working on it right now. Well, that's a great, I think, segue into one of the first questions we wanted to ask you about, which is, you know, people that are uh, getting into this area of, of study of airway and uh, airway prosthodontics, sleep medicine in the dental world, um, you know, they, like you say, it can be overwhelming uh, and what, what it does to a practice. Um, but as they're starting to get into their training, you know, when, when Wes and I got into this, we had been going through, um, you know, sort of the spear pathway for a few years and had been to a number of workshops before airway was really part of uh, facially generated treatment planning. And, uh, and then we kind of saw that evolve. And so it sort of became the next thing for us. We had already taken a lot of courses on occlusion and on treatment planning. And uh, we kind of had that basic knowledge and it just, it opened up a whole other thing as it has for a lot of people that have been involved with this for, for years. But now you have somebody that's maybe new, newer out of dental school, and they're looking to figure out where to start their education in airway, because it is such a, a hot topic as, as we can see by the type of courses that are being uh, offered at big meetings, as well as at Spear. Where should they start? And I guess really specifically, I'm not trying to just push your course. It sounds like a softball question, but I'm more asking the question of, should we start learning airway before learning the basics of say occlusion and treatment planning? How can that be integrated in to, you know, for a dentist who's maybe newer out of school? Because I think there's this idea, well, I'm going to go in and start treating airway, but can you do that well without understanding some of these other fundamentals or having a more advanced knowledge, uh, say that you would get at a prosthodontic residency or at some more advanced occlusion type of courses? Okay. So I'm going to give you two different answers because it really, it deserves it. <laughs> uh, you, your, when you say treating airway, the, what is inferred from that is I'm going to make something. I'm going to make an appliance. That's really treating sleep. So let's kind of keep that as a separate entity. So if you're <laughs> asking me, can someone that wants to treat sleep, go off and learn how to make an appliance, how to, um, you know, um, bill medical, all that. And should they? Yeah, I think they ought to. Um, that's why we have a whole course set up at Spear is an outside course that's separate from everything else that people go and learn how to make appliances, how to bill for medical, how to work with physicians, all the rest. So if your vision is I'm going to treat and whatever words you choose, airway or sleep, I'm going to do that in my practice. And your vision is you're going to make something. It's going to be, I'm going to generate an, an appliance and I'm going to bill for that appliance. Then yes, you can just go out and do that right away. And it doesn't matter how long you've been out of school. The only caveat to that is typically those appliances are going to cause some sort of TMD type of symptom. And so you have to be able to manage bites and manage muscle discomfort. But I think a lot of people are fairly comfortable doing that right out of school even. If you really at its core want to, want to deal with airway, airway is a structural issue. It's a skeletal issue, in my opinion. Uh, at at its basis. And in fact, uh, my, the analogy I gave this weekend and I'm starting to use more and more of out at Spear is that Frank Spear taught us how to do facially generated treatment planning by saying that treatment planning was just like setting up a denture. You set the central incisors, of, uh, the incisal edge of the central incisors, then you work to the lateral canine, you work your way back. And when you're done with the upper arch, then you make the lower arch. So we always start with aesthetics and then function. And we go to structure and biologic questions after that. The evolution of airway has taken FGTP into 3D, meaning 
if you really take it to its ultimate um, conclusion or beginning, shall we say, no one ever gets a wax rim out of a case pan and begins by setting the central incisors. You put a wax rim in, you evaluate lip support and transverse support, and you adjust the wax rim until you get a perfect wax rim. Then you set the central incisors. The AP dimension and the transverse dimension of the wax rim, that's the airway. So we've never done a denture. No one's ever done a denture without making the airway perfect to begin with. However, restorative dentists and orthodontists all the time do dentistry and orthodontics to a lousy wax rim. They are gifted a deficient maxilla and they figure out how to work to it. That's what occlusal philosophies have done for years. That's what orthodontics has done with for years by doing uh, interproximal reduction, taking out teeth, lingual verting teeth. They work to a lousy wax rim. So to your question now, if I really want to do airway, what do I have to understand? You have to understand how to do treatment planning and occlusion before you get there. So in 2020 at Spear, you cannot get into the airway workshop until you go through the other two. You yeah. have to have that knowledge. Yeah, that makes, so, it makes sense. It makes sense. Like you say, it's a, and I like that analogy, the, the, the wax, the wax analogy. Ran. That very, fits very, perfect with it, things we've talked about before. Really well. Yeah. Jeff, you said something in there and I just wanted us to elaborate it, not to really jump off on a complete tangent, but I, I'd like to hear your your opinion on your opinion is that you said that airway is a skeletal issue and that's your opinion. Can you talk in contrast to what other reason would there be an airway issue other than a skeletal issue? Well, you could have, I mean, obviously you can point to large adenoids, large tonsils. Some people uh, have bigger tongues. Um, some people have bigger uvulas, but even if you were to go there, you, you could say, well, those issues, for example, let's say a kid has large tonsils and adenoids. What malocclusion or what maladaptation occurs because of that? And that's be what happens is it creates a smaller skeleton. If you open your mouth and breathe through your mouth and through, instead of through your nose, your maxilla is going to be smaller, your mandible is going to be smaller. If your tongue is tied to the floor of your mouth, the maxilla is going to be smaller and the mandible is going to be small. If, I mean, all, you go through all these scenario, including if the maxilla is smaller, it also tends to not move forward. So the AP dimension is off and that causes your soft palate to drape into your airway. So the number one point of airway obstruction is the soft palate and it's related to where's the maxilla? How big is my wax rim? If my wax room is right, you rarely have a soft palate that drapes into the airway and becomes problematic. If the maxilla is correct, you rarely have a mandible that doesn't follow that growth and development pattern. Now, there are exceptions to all these things. You can fall and have a disc displacement and not grow the mandible. I mean, there, there are obviously exceptions that people can come up with. But if we go through and try to create uh, the, the most... Um, you know, from a number standpoint or the most that you and I are going to be treating every day, walking into our practice, it's a skeletal issue. And mm. the skeletal issue begins with maxillary hypoplasia. That's the big problem. Do you think yeah, yeah. that, do you and it's, think, and it's really, it's, e yeah. it's either the soft, if, if it's not a, a primary cause, the skeleton's not a primary cause, it's, it becomes, if the soft tissue is, I think what you're saying too, is if the soft tissue is the issue, it, it turns into a skeletal problem, uh, even if it, even if it's not the well, primary it, cause. Exactly. So in, in the example of tonsils and adenoids, it would cause the skeletal problem. And in the ter terms of soft palate, it's because of the skeletal problem that the soft tissue issue is there. Right. I mean, little thing. I mean, I'll give you a good example is deviated septums. So a deviated septum, they did studies on kids. They had 100 kids with deviated septums. When they expanded them, they either completely fixed or mostly fixed the, the deviated septum. So if you now are an adult with a deviated septum, it's rarely that a baseball hit you in the nose. It's right. routinely that your maxilla is too constricted. 
the vomer has nowhere to go and it has to deviate or move one way or another to fit within a small apparatus because it's endochondral in nature and the maxilla is intramembranous. So maxillas grow when you use them correctly and the nose is just a set pattern. It will figure out a way to fit. The, mm -hmm. the issue that we keep working with is that physicians, unfortunately, are make, you know, make the diagnosis and stick within their world. So if they make a diagnosis and they choose to, the patient wants to not do CPAP, they want to get fixed, they send them to an ENT. Well, an ENT, while I believe needs to be, is a huge player on the team and needs to be in the team, an ENT rarely looks at the skeleton. Facial plastic ENTs do because they have the ability to move it, but all the other ENTs don't move the skeleton. That's not part of their training. So you send a small maxilla to an ENT, what are they going to do? They're going to make the deviated septum fit within the small maxilla. A guy named Williams just finished a study a three, about three months ago out at Stanford and said that when he looked back at his, his patients, he operated and did septaloplasties or septaloplasties and turbinant reductions, you know, that general type of surgery, make mm -hmm. the septum better, that the symptomatic patients routinely had too small a maxilla. Mm -hmm. And his recommendation is make the maxilla bigger. Mm -hmm. So why don't we just make the maxilla bigger when they're little and we don't have to worry about it? Why don't we why don't we, when a patient goes into the ENT before they start getting their nose worked on, why don't we talk about, hey, your teeth are in the wrong, your your skeleton's in the wrong place. Let's move it. No. Yeah. So, well, so, so when you so when you're teaching the the seminars, for instance, mm -hmm. you know, you were talking about this this training, uh, maybe pathway, if you will, that that you know, if you want to just treat sleep, as you said, and I think that's well said that, you know. And I would say that uh, maybe there's a little bit more to it as far as managing those TMJ and TMD issues that may come. And I, I mean, you're right. Yeah, I think it, we're more comfortable handling that maybe than we are with some of the other things. But so when you teach the seminar and not the workshop, uh, what, what's, I'm just interested, you know, what's the response uh, for people that say, what, what should I do next? Because, you know, what you're, I, there's so many, when I, when I took the seminar that you, that you taught, I came in and, you know, I'd already had all these other uh, uh, kind of baseline courses. So I sort of knew, you know, where to, where to go with it. But um, I get the feeling that there's a lot of people looking for sort of a, a quick, <laughs> a quick way to, uh, to get into this. And I feel like the Seattle protocol is the most systematic approach to this for, for sure. But uh, somebody comes to that seminar, do you find routinely that, that they're, they're coming to you and saying, having a lot of questions about how this fits in with treatment planning? Are you just basically directing them down that FGTP type of pathway at that point? Yes. Yeah, they're, the seminar, and, and I don't know of any, you know, there, it, there would be very few seminars you go to where you walk away and change your practice mm -hmm. yeah. based, based on a seminar. Um, you know, if you go to a seminar, even, even, even on like veneers or bonding or, you know, whatever, I mean, you'll change something, but I'm telling you at, at how you run a practice and how you think about dentistry doesn't change in a seminar. Yeah. Uh, you really have to have a workshop. So what my goal of the seminar is, uh, there's twofold. One goal is the obvious. If you want to pursue this, go to the workshop. Um, but the bigger one for me, honestly, is if people walk away from the seminar and know how to go back to their practice and find people by looking at dental signs and symptoms, find people that may have airway issues and just get them out to someone that can help them, then we've done a good job with the seminar. Mm -hmm. So I call, my son's name is Jake and Jake had all these problems. And so I always ask, who is your Jake? And honestly, at the end of the seminar, as I began, I always begin the seminar saying this, at the end of this, all I want you to do is be able to find Jake and not let him sit in your practice anymore. And, and those, that's going to be husbands, wives, moms, dads, brothers, sisters, you know, whatever. Uh, it could be the, them, the people sitting in the audience, right? But I want them to go to get the information, 
to be able to go out and go, okay, I know a guy down the street might be able to help come up with a diagnosis and start sending people out. If they want to come back for the workshop, that's awesome. Yeah. But for sure, I want them just to go home and go, you might have a problem. You might have, you, you might have a problem. Go, yeah. go see, go see so-and-so and see if they, if you really did. I want to make one more comment on while we're on this topic before we go on, Wes, I'll let you go on to that next question. But you made an interesting <clears throat> comment earlier about, um, you know, you send it to the ENT, they're working within their kind of their framework that they usually see. They don't see more. And uh, Wes and I are part of a, we've, since we went through a lot of the training out there, we, we decided, well, we need to put together a group uh, of physicians and, and dentists. And so we've got a pretty good, pretty good situation happening with, with some really with pediatric sleep physician and some ENTs. And the other day we were at our meeting last week and we presented, uh, presented a Bimax expansion orthognathic case that were, that just got, just had surgery a few weeks ago. And it was just so interesting to hear the response from the sleep physicians and the ENTs because you just, you hear insurance written all over it. You know, it's, well, okay, how many people though are going to actually do that? How many people are going to actually say yes to that? How many people, it, it seemed like that has been so just ingrained and, and has been so drilled into their heads, man, even these are people who are willing to come out to this meeting. You know, these are pretty progressive guys at this meeting and you could just hear like they're show, I'm showing the case. Hey, this is what we're doing. This is the goal. This is the amount of movement. And they're like, well, that's really cool. But you know, are people really going to do that? And I wonder how, how do you, how do you go there with physicians when that, cause that seems like it's always the place that they're not always, but it's a significant area of resistance. Yeah. Um, they have, I, I actually got into one of those the other day and I said to the guy, uh, he was going asking me and I said, you know what, you know what I was doing yesterday? He goes, no. And I said, I just inserted a, you know, a lower arch of dentistry and completed a full mouth rehabilitation. And they wrote me a check and I told him how, you know, how much they wrote me the check for. And, and he just couldn't believe <laughs> <laughs> that people would write a check for that amount of money. And they, so they, they work in a world that we don't have to deal with and they don't understand. You know, we've been for years looking at people and going, you know, we can make, you know, facially we can make you more attractive. Or Mike Gunson was out at the Spear Summit showing these huge movements of the mandible in order to make them not only more attractive, but more functional because of some condylar issues patients had and such. I mean, there are surgeons all over the country that are, you know, like multiple times a week going to the OR doing orthognathing and they don't do anything else. They don't put implants in, they don't take out teeth. They do orthognathic surgery. People will write a check for things they want. Now, the neat thing is, Greg Kinzer and I, we were talking about it the other day at the FGTP uh, workshop. And I've been doing dentistry 31 years and he's been like 25. And I could come up with maybe a dozen cases of orthognathic surgery in 31 years. And he had five. All right. So let's just between us, let's call it 15. In, in all that amount of time, and we're having people come to us that are, you know, that can afford it in both our practices. We have those kind of practices, right? I right now have 12 people that are either have just gone through or are ready to go through it. And the reason is that I'm able to now present what it can do from a health standpoint. That's right. So people that come into my office um, want to be healthy now. And when we go through the protocol and we finish with the protocol, um, they say, what can I do to be healthy? What can I do to feel like this? And they'll, they'll do whatever I tell them to do at that point in time because they, they get the feel, that, that feeling. They just want to feel better. 
So people walk in and say, I want off CPAP. So, you know, when you tell them, here's what you got to do, they'll at least explore the possibility. Mm -hmm. I used to say, your smile's really ugly and, you know, you need to have orthodontic surgery. People, people wouldn't do it. I mean, it's rare that people would go, yeah, you're right. I am ugly. I'll go get this done. <laughs> but if you tell them you could feel better, they, they're all in. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I think that's, as you said, I mean, it's the, we live in that world all the time <clears throat> or at least more so than what they do. And so we're used to, you know, talking about a double arch hybrid type of case, you know, and, and, and talking about those types of fees and looking somebody in the face and saying, that's going to be 60,000, 70,000, whatever it is. Yeah. So it is easier for us. And I just, I just really feel like the more I've gotten into this, the more I resonate with your approach of saying, you know, I really don't want to be in that world. I want to do dentistry, you know? And, and I think, you know, you, you re you reiterate that and reiterate that through your teaching. And I think that it's, it's tough. You, you really have to find people that have that same mindset in the medical world that you have to have them at least to some extent, you know, to, to be able to get it. And man, it's tough. So anyway, Wes, I'll let you, well, I'll let you. The other part, the other part that I always remind people is we, we get nervous talking to physicians, dentists do yeah. all the time. And what you have to remember is just what you did. You presented a case that they had never seen. They had heard about it maybe, but they haven't seen it. They don't know about MARPI or SARPI or SFOT or anything that an orthodontist can do. They don't know what we can do with four-year-olds and expansion and myofunctional therapy and all, and all the changes. They don't, know, they don't know any of that. And so you're, we are at such an advantage when we walk in and are, and are presenting to physicians because they don't have a clue what we can do. And we, we actually control all the areas that they wish they could deal with. I mean, the the NT is looking at it going, well, crap, it's all. And I'm thinking, no, just make it bigger. It's fine. We'll, you'll be okay. Give me a second. I think, you know, medicine has done a uh, great job finding something that will help to control and the, you know, the gold standard CPAP for airway. I mean, it works if you can wear it. And, um, but well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop the question there because actually the newer studies are saying it doesn't do it as well as we thought. There we go. And so I think, I think we're going to find out in a few years. It isn't really as effective. Yeah, you know what happens is they've been judging it for years based on the apnea hypopnea index. So mm-hmm. they not it knocks the numbers down. But I don't the majority of people it still leaves them with stressful breathing all night long which creates mm-hmm. inflammation and so mm-hmm. it's I I we're starting to see the literature leak out that that says it's not as good as we thought. Interesting. Uh, Interesting. And they're looking at inflammatory markers and that type of thing as opposed to AHI. Yep. Reduction mm-hmm. in diabetes, reduction in inflammation. Study last year looked at inflammation over a six month period of time and found no difference between apnea patients that wore it, the CPAP the way they're supposed to, and those that didn't wear it at all. Hmm. Wow. There's a, there's a lousy study on, but it does sh- did show that cardiovascular incidents didn't change. There's a study on diabetes. It's a better study that said it didn't get under control. Um, mm. So well, and- when you look at just some of the subjective health health outcomes, it's it's depressing sometimes, you know, because yeah. the the objective seems good, but you look at these subjective outcomes, and we're just reading studies the other night comparing you know oral appliances to Appian. Still, in, in, in the subjective outcomes were. <laughs> We're not great. I mean, there were some improvements, but you know, and that and that would seem to jive with the idea that that we're still we're still stressed. We're still, you know, the body's still in a pro-inflammatory state. Yeah, and but I I wouldn't get. I mean, I personally don't get all that excited about mandibular advancement appliances either. So mm-hmm. right, mm-hmm. not a not a big fan of them either. But sure. So let's talk a little bit about that because you know John and I both. Um, you know, have dental general dentist practice. And, uh, when we came back from 
that's trying to apply this to a dental business per se of doing hygiene checks and fillings and crowns and implants and restorative dentistry. You know, it, it requires just like you said, maybe, and um, just like I was taught by Steve Carstens and Ken Burley, that you need a person in your practice to help run this part of your dental business. Uh, maybe that's, in my case, it's a person, a dental, dental hygienist that now is a myofunctional therapist and, and is certified in uh, nasal breathing re-education and all those things. And so pretty much retired her into this and which is Seattle protocol. And, and she's part of our airway club and works with orthodontists and other dentists around the community. But I'll, I'll be honest with you, that is a very difficult thing to do for a, even, you know, maybe even John who has an associate or myself, who's a sole practitioner in a mid-sized town, you know, a town of 600,000 to, to dive in and make the investment into someone, you know, that with the education they need and pouring the time and effort. And how, how do, how, how do you even make this work, right? Without doing that. And even when doing that, you have to understand that some of this is a loss leader to the cases that you're talking about, which John and I are experiencing. Yeses, right? Mm -hmm. We're experiencing people that will say, I don't want to wear a, you know, a piece of plastic, a CPAP. I want my jaw fixed mm -hmm. and they're going and getting it done and they're doing whatever type of, you know, uh, surgery that takes right. and, and the restorative dentistry often and the restorative dentistry also i mean i'm sitting with a lady today and she's wearing cpap and she wants fixed she wants fixed and uh she's going to spend probably thirty forty thousand dollars you know to do it but it takes a person leading her right in your team to get to that point and yeah, so what, time, what are the successful business models that you've seen i'm just interested and i know that we could get into high weeds but you know, just, just kind of speak to that if you can, or if you would on, on, as you've taught people and you've kind of, you know, exposed them to this protocol and how to, you know, how are you seeing that implemented into practices successfully from a business standpoint? Okay. So the, obviously the easiest one to implement into a practice is making appliances because mm -hmm. you just screen people get them out to a physician, get them back from the physician, make an appliance. Um, and that's kind of how I began that I would, I would do that and then get referrals from the, from them. We said that that's sleep and that airway really is a different way of thinking about where teeth belong. So the, if you have a practice that has a core philosophy of treatment planning, and we'll use Spear as an example of setting the case up to the aesthetics first, or I mean, it could be any number of, of treatment planning concepts. But within that concept, it's just thinking about new positions for the teeth. So if you have a practice right now that already has, is doing FGTP thought processes and occlusion, it's, you're not changing your practice at all. Right. The only thing you're doing is when you are treatment planning, you begin by saying, does this patient have an airway issue? You evaluate them. You may screen them with some tool, um, pulse ox, something like that. And then you include that as the in the overall decision trees. Where do I put the front teeth? How do I get them there? How do I get the smile where it's supposed to be? Do I make the wax rim ideal before I begin completing my dentistry. So it's just a treatment planning decision at that point in time. There is absolutely nothing that changes except your options for therapy. So you don't have to have anyone help you do that. Um, what I like about the Seattle protocol is when you now present to someone and say, you know, really, it, it, I think you ought to do orthognathic surgery. You have walked through a control strategy with them and made them into an appliance. Like this piece of, this piece of plastic makes you better. This style of plastic makes you better. 
Now, how would you like to get rid of it? Because that's kind of how we teach it now. Here's your appliance. How do I take it back from you? And so I like proof of concept before I actually make a recommendation of something as big as Marpy Sarpy, you know, um, maximum mandibular advancement. I like that. Doesn't mean you have to have it. You can just say the wax room is too small. The wax room needs to be here. The ideal treatment plan for you is this. That's going to make you feel better. And then just think of it completely as a dental, a dental, uh, treatment planning tool and a new, a new part of that. So Wesley, to answer your question, you don't need to change your practice at all if you've already got a treatment planning concept that you're working to. And FGTP works the best for, for us uh, when thinking it through. So um, that, that's the difference between airway and sleep. If you want to then pursue it and go and get a little deeper into it. Um, the way I do it in my practice is I have someone that oversees it. So my, my, my myofunctional therapist is my hygienist. Um, so we have an in-house person. Now she doesn't, um, she's not an employee of mine for myofunctional. She has her own business entity completely separate from mine, but that's where I refer to. And obviously, if she's here seeing patients, she's going to be kind of making her own business because she's going to look and find tongue ties and all I, and breathing issues and such. And she screens them, and I just confirm what, what she's done. Um, for walking through the Seattle protocol, I have a dental assistant. And every time she walks through the protocol with a patient, I'm, I bonus her for that. So that's how she comes up with her bonus at the end of the year is how many times she goes through, goes through it. She has her own um, column of in the schedule and she schedules when she's going to follow up with people on her own around me. So when I'm here and she's, she knows we have a procedure, she won't schedule when there's a procedure that's, you know, I'm presenting a treatment plan and she can go make a phone call or see a patient at that point in time. So she works around it. So that's how I do it. Um, I know a guy that actually in, that has a practice in Beverly Hills. He's one of our mentors. He pretty much sees a whole group of young fit females. Now these, that can be men as well, right? But most of his patients are fit. Most of his patients tend to be younger. He's a younger dentist. They sort of follow his demographics. And so he's actually incorporated nasal breathing therapy as part of his initial examination. At Spear, they talk about the thing that brings people into your practice is making it unique and the experience unique. He talks to them about it. And if they have any of the signs and symptoms, which a lot of people do, he'll go ahead and walk through nasal breathing therapy and just make it part of the initial exam. He bumped his fee up a little bit for his examination and, and he just goes. If they don't resolve with that, then he says, well, I've got this protocol that you might be interested in to, to try to find the proper appliance. So he just made it, made it part of what he always does for every patient that walks in, just as a way of making it a unique experience for the patient. Hmm. Um, so yeah, I've got buddies that do hygiene like you've done. Um, my, I guess my biggest thing is that I, I don't, if you want to run some sort of protocol, I really think the dentist shouldn't be, as soon as you can, I think you ought to be out of it. Mm -hmm. um, it just, it, you need to be cutting on teeth. I just want to do dentistry. I don't want to be, I don't want to be making these appliances and, and talking to them about, you know, how did they feel last night and did their brooks and get better? I want, I want to cut, I want to smell enamel burning, right? Huh? <laughs> right. So like the final follow up question to this, and you answered a little bit it already is when do you have that resolution versus control conversation? You know, sometimes I feel yeah. like, you know, you can have that, like you said, right up front with the patient. And a lot of times John and I, we, we are, mm -hmm. I mean, you, you can almost, you can, when once you see this stuff, it's just like, you can't even unsee it, you know? Yeah. And so you look at this and you're like, Whoa, and then you start asking them the questions and they're like, how do you know all this about me? And they have a, an awareness, you know, co-diagnostic, you know, mentality at that point. So 
you know, sometimes they just start believing you because you start to understand things that no doctor has ever understood. So I know you said you like to walk through the Seattle protocol is, you know, and it's what, what's your thoughts yeah, on that? No, but the, the protocol is just, is, you know, we needed to come up with a way of getting away from sleep, making mm-hmm. the sleep appliance every time. That's good. And recognize, recognizing that there are other appliances that can make people healthy and we don't have to be proven jaws so far forward. And so, in fact, the newer data out is telling us that three millimeters of protrusion is probably all you need for most people. Mm-hmm. There's, there's, it's rare that you ever need to go beyond that. And so it, it just confirms more and more that the protocol makes sense and that we ought to be following through with something a lot. We shouldn't be jumping into these big appliances right away. Um, but what you said is perfect. It's, it's when do you do the resolution? Sometimes you can see it right away. Well, how did you see it right away? You saw it because of your knowledge of dentistry, your knowledge of dentistry and that there t- you knew and you were probably seeing teeth and damage to teeth and stuff. But all I want you to do is take it to the skeleton, right? So if the teeth are in the wrong place and they're constricted and they're wearing and all the rest, then the skeleton is probably in the wrong place. And if the maxilla is in the wrong place, that means the nasal cavity is too small. So if you have a constricted nasal uh, maxilla, you can't breathe through your nose as well. And so you are not as healthy. And I mean, there's so many things linked to it. Health, I mean, at its core, oxidative stress is linked to nasal breathing or the inability to breathe through your nose. Uh, memory, I mean, is nas- is is backed up better when you breathe through your nose. Oh, I mean, just it's the way that things are supposed to be. And we can do something about it. So when do you have the discussion? I mean, do I have to walk through the protocol? No, I don't. It's just if you're doing airway, you're trying to get the, the airway better. And if it blends perfectly with what you're going to recommend from a dental standpoint, a treatment, dental treatment standpoint, then do it. Go for it. The beauty of the protocol is that when people are not ready for that, that's right. Then you can say, "All right, but let's get you at least under control so you don't get sicker." And then when you've got them under control, you can then say, "All right, when you're ready, we're going to try to turn you into this, rather than just letting you try to exist with a piece of plastic for a lifetime." Um, so use the protocol for, for whatever it's needed for, for Mm -hmm. proof of concept, for a control strategy, but, uh, but do dentistry and dentistry is the resolution part. Here's how I make you better. Do you think that your personal experience with Jake, because nothing's really personal until it's really specific to you and helped you in your journey and understanding anatomy was that the light bulb for you like what in your practice you know you're as a general dentist and then a prosthodontist you're thinking there's more to what we're seeing here was it your son or was it it was actually me okay It it was doing my case yeah um I, yeah, probably my case because um, Jake, Jake, I missed. So I've been, I've been working from behind the whole time. So right now, actually Jake's in a Marpy and he's got some protraction. He's got bollard plates down below and protraction elastic. So I'm still working on him. Um, and we still haven't quite got him completely breathing well, sleeping well. But um, for, it was really me. By my, my problem was I had tonsil infections, so my tongue dropped down really low. My maxilla constricted, so I had bilateral crossbite with end-on anterior occlusion. And I needed significant amount of expansion in order to, to get my occlusion corrected. And when we did it, I noticed the differences. Um, the other day we were at a study club meeting using a rhinometer and a pharyngometer and I am the fattest oldest guy there and yet I had the biggest best airway the least <laughs> collapsible of 
all the air was. Mm -hmm. So it was, yeah, kind of vindication for all the stuff that I've gone through and that, you know, I won. <laughs> right. Awesome. <laughs> so, That's good. And, so. so you mentioned, um, and, and you know, for, for, I know we're, we're definitely in at a, having a high, good high level conversation here. For those of you who don't know some of this terminology, we're talking about MARPI, which is basically a uh, tad expansion is another word for that. Use mini screw assisted rapid paddle expansion. Um, I, I want to ask one, cause we've been talking a lot about concepts, which is awesome. But I want to ask maybe one detail question, which is uh, surgically facilitated ortho, as you refer to SFOT, versus MARPI. Um, is there a move away from SFOT, do you feel like, or do you feel that it still has its place in the thin tissue phenotype? Uh, tell us a little bit about kind of how you're making that decision. And is it just simply, you know, dimensional decision, or is it a tissue decision, or is it a combination? Um. So, I mean, it's a great question, and um, and I probably won't do the answer justice with, in a short time. But let the I'm not moving away from SFOT. Um, thin tissue, thin bone, absolutely benefits from it. Um, base of tongue or oral pharyngeal obstruction will benefit from it because you're growing the oral pharynx. Um, what it doesn't do is if by just simply moving the teeth out, you don't actually alter nasal airway, airflow or air dimensions, right? So while your oral cavity is larger and the tongue can come out of the airway and enter the oral cavity and improve the airway that way, you don't get the advantage, even though the maxilla appears to be wider, you don't get the real advantage of the nasal cavity alteration. So MARPI or SARPI are better ways of doing that, surgically assisted or just mi micro implant assisted rapid palate expansion. Um, <clears throat> because you're literally moving the bone out and now the nasal volume and airflow, everything improves. Uh, you also can, well, actually in both of them, you could get some AP change. So I can't say that you can't get it with Sarpy because uh, I did in my mouth. Um, so I think there's actually been one study done where they did, uh, they did an expansion move. I think it was SF, um, Sarpy. So they actually made high Lafort cuts. And at the same time that they had flapped them, they made corticotomy cuts. And so I think that's probably the best of both worlds because when you have constricted maxillas in particular, there are going to be many times when the bone's extremely thin or dehissed. And so you're moving bad bone, bad tissue out into a wider position. And I, you know, you're still going to have be prone to all the disadvantages of recession and, and and such associated with it. So I think a lot of the cases you need to consider given, um, I mean, if for sure, if you're going to do a, a SARPI where you're making the cuts anyway, given do those corticotomy cuts, add some bone and you get sure. a huge advantage. So hmm. it's not that much more surgery. Right. Yeah. It might as well be. And like you say, many times these cases have, it seems like they, they have that poor bone quality, thin tissue yeah. because we've got, and we've got lingual version of teeth with roots often out the buckle if they've had ortho. So yeah, it seems like it's rare that you would have a case you wouldn't need to do it. And, and we're also finding now that the procedure called dome uh, dome is making the cuts, but with a SARPI, you actually cut through the pterygoid plate. And with dome, you just let them, the actual activator break it for you as you expand, it'll just pop. And if you're doing that, I would bet and, and that even periodontists that are com that will be comfortable making that cut because hmm. they're just making a high, a high cut, which is exactly the cut they're going to make when they do corticotomies around the teeth anyway. And then they make a cut between, they just, put a little piezo cut between the centrals and tap on it and it pops open. 
So I would bet that there are a fair number of periodontists that would even be comfortable there, which grows our access to people that would do that procedure for us. Mm -hmm. yeah. Is, um, is Spear looking to expand maybe, maybe you can't speak to this or are you all considering maybe bringing in some of the specialists like periodontist and, um, like teaching them the surgery. Yeah. Teaching the surgery, uh, even oral surgeons. We need it, man. We need it bad. We need it really bad, Jeff. Like there's people that really can identify these things in rural areas. And even in small towns like John's, I mean, it's not a small town, it's 50,000 people. And people have to drive an hour and a half just to have the surgery. Yeah. We're talking about like, can we go to, you know, we're even right now trying to go our, take our study club down to like Rick Robley's office and yeah. see what they're doing or, you know, but I mean, to really, besides like the Wilco brothers and a few people that are around, I mean, there's just not, there's not a lot of organized courses in this. I mean, do you, do you see a future there for that or what? Yeah, I was smiling because, well, you know, Art of Treatment Planning at Spear now has Becca Bacow and Mike Gunson in it. Um, and Jim Janikowski, a period on this, is going to be joining them soon as well. Mm. So the court, the seminar has people in it, but I'm laughing because I actually spent the weekend um, writing notes ex exactly, speaking exactly to that because mm. I, I agree. I think if we're going to provide a philosophy of you need to be able to do these things then we need to help people with it, with the surgical part of it. So well, this is great. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. You know, I have no pull at spear at all, but it is one of the things <laughs> well, we're going to keep, talking. we're going to keep pounding that drum and <laughs> That's right. until that time, until we that time, say Jeff said it's going to happen, but yeah. we'll, we'll be thinking it until that have. time. If you're listening to this and you've not been to Spear or you have and you need to refresh what you've just heard, there's so much yeah. to learn. And we have a great place for, for you to do that. And that's Spear Online Education. It's probably one of the best platforms that John and I have ever been a part of mm -hmm. as far as like taking what Jeff has said or what any director or any workshop or seminar you've done and then coming back and actually re-listening to the same things with even a higher detail really than what maybe they gave you in the seminar. Imagine being able to rewind a hundred times just to try to figure out step one of the Seattle protocol. Well, you can do that and you can do, do that at Spear Online. Now, it just so happens for our listeners, we do have a special offer code for that and that's promo code T as in the, D as in dental, as in G, guys, TDG20. And that's going to get you $20 off uh, for our listeners per month. So we thank Spear Online uh, for providing us that uh, access code for you to get, uh, save yourself 240 bucks a year, which is pretty awesome. So I thank you so much, Jeff. You've done a lot about the online education. And I just recently was checking out some of the stuff there. It's even more detailed into the Seattle protocol. It's pretty awesome. Yeah, and we're excited too that you guys are on the progressive side with this, thinking about what needs to come next and how to, again, make this more systematic. And that's what we have always found with Spear is that the goal is to try to develop systems that can get people where they need to go in a way that is easy to understand, uh, that's based on on good science and research. And, and we we appreciate that so much. If you haven't been a part of that uh, ecosystem, I know that's one of those great buzzwords, Go check it out at uh, Spear Education and uh, definitely go check out uh, Jeff's stuff because uh, we know that uh, you probably already heard about Jeff, but if you haven't really uh, dove into what uh, he's teaching, a good place to start is the online and then go check out his seminar, go check out some workshops because uh, we, we definitely know that, yeah, if, if you follow this conversation, you've probably already taken some of this stuff. If you really followed everything, if, you're, if you feel lost, I think that's okay. You know, I think that all we need to do here is we need to be okay with with having those high level conversations and realize, Hey, if you don't know where we're talking about, Hey, there's a great place to start. And I think that we can get a good conversation going, even with somebody that's relatively new to this, uh, through, through what's going on with Spears. So Wes, I'll let you close this out. Jeff, I just want to thank you so much. You've, you've, you really have uh, pioneered a new era in dentistry. Uh, you've changed uh, my practice, John's practice. You've changed medicine in East Tennessee. 
Yep. Uh, you have changed medicine in East Tennessee, and I think you need to be proud about that. And we applaud you uh, for what you're doing for our children and our patients because you have defined a new era in dentistry. And I know that sounds lofty, but I'm not. I'm not really uh, saying doing it enough justice for what you've done for our patients and our practitioners. So thank you so much, Jeff, for coming on our show. Yep. Thanks, Jeff. Appreciate it. That was fun. So uh, if you're listening to this, hey, check us out on uh, Facebook. Send us a, you know, uh, a message if you have questions. Um, if you need uh, to reach someone at Spear Education, you can check them there out online at speareducation.com. And uh, of course, hit us up on Twitter. The Instagram, thanks to Carson for hooking us up with the Instagram account last year. That really has kind of paid dividends. So thank you so much, Carson, there at Spear Education. And so for Jeff Roush, John, and myself, we are the Dental Guys.